While there are some people who may be concerned about the origins of Halloween and its focus on blood, death, horror, and the occult, to millions of youngsters across the nation, it has been adopted as a time to pursue scary fun. It is an opportunity to dress up in ghoulish or fanciful costumes, to engage in the fantasy of being a witch or a vampire, ghost or devil. Eager trick-or-treaters solicit candy door-to-door -door or bob for apples at Halloween parties. Others brave haunted houses and horror movie marathons, while the more daring visit cemeteries at midnight, play with Ouija boards, and hold seances in an effort to contact spirits of the dead. What you commonly call Halloween, in the occult world they call it Samhain. Now, when you look at the name, it looks as if it's saying Sam Hayen or something like that. No, 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 no. This is properly pronounced in the ancient Gaelic as Samhain. Samhain, according to occult tradition, was the Lord of the Dead. Now, around 900 BC, a very fierce nomadic people came into the areas of what used to be known as Gaul, Saxony, Brittany, we know it now as the British Isle, and of course it eventually went to Scotland Island and the rest of the surrounding areas. These people were known as the Celts. Now the Celtic people, they were so fierce and so barbaric that twice they held off the famous Ro um, Roman legion and extracted heavy tribute from Rome itself. They literally held all power from 900 B.C. to approximately 900 A.D. in that area. The Celtic Lord of the Dead, Samhain, is just another name, Samhain, for Nimrod. You study all the myths, all the occult myths of Samhain. He is also a stag god. has horns just like the... Um, stag god of the occult world that is so constant. But this particular time of the year, October 29th through the 31st, these, those three days constitute what's known as Samhain. Everyone thinks Halloween is just a one night thing, October 31st, but it is not. See, in the occult world, this is a three day fire festival. It lasts from the 29th through the 31st. During the time when the Druid priest held power in Great Britain, now the Druids held all power. You couldn't get married without their, with their, with, yeah, without their permission. You couldn't hold any type of official title in the clan without their permission. You couldn't even attend any of their religious ceremonies without their permission. They literally held power over all life and death, and you're really going to find out how in this example. During the Nights of Samhain, the Druids would gather at these giant megalithic stone circles. One of the most common known stone circle is, of course, Stonehenge. Just about everyone has seen Stonehenge at one time or another, be it in picture or if they were actually there. Now Stonehenge, as I said, it's a megalithic crop circle, uh, yeah, megalithic crop circle, that's the UFOs, wrong subject, but we could always get there. <laughs> this is a megalithic stone circle. It served three specific functions. First of all, it was a temple complex. Second of all, it served as an astrological observatory. Third, it served as a place of human sacrifice. Archaeologists have already unearthed underneath Stonehenge, over 4,000 human skeletal remains. And that's just Stonehenge. There are hundreds of these throughout the British Isles. This one, believe it or not, is small compared to some of the others. The one in Aysbury is over a mile in circumference. This is just a small one. And there's over 4,000 um, dead human sacrifices underneath it. You multiply that by X amount of hundreds of these stone circles, and I think you'll understand what the Druids were all about and why they were so greatly feared by the common folk. During the time of Samhain, the Druids, in this example, they would meet at Stonehenge. 
they had a giant cauldron, a black pot, that they would fill with what you would best understand as an apple cider-like substance. They would light the pot, and then all the Druid priests would go out throughout the countryside. They would go to um, various mansions, to castles, to people of nobility such as the earls, marquises, dukes, what have you. They would walk up to the front door of these places, and you want to know what they would yell out? Trick or treat, exactly. Now see, trick or treat is a two-part expression that literally sent waves and waves and waves of panic throughout the people who ever heard it. You see, if the Lord of the Manor cooperated with the um, Druids, he would take one of his own servants or one of his own household members, someone of his own family, and pass them over to the Druids to be used as a human sacrifice offering that night. The Druids would leave you a treat for your cooperation. They would take a pumpkin that was previously hollowed out and filled with human fat. They would leave it on the front doorstep and light it. This served as a water protection from all the demonic forces that would be unleashed that night. Now this is where we get into the trick. If you did not cooperate with the Druids, they would take blood from a dead um, body that they had actually been dragging around and paint the six-pointed star with a circle around it. This is known as a hexagram from the Latin hexer for six. This is the foulest, the most evil of all the symbols in the occult world. I don't care what anyone else tells you. You need that symbol if you're going to summon a demon to this plane of existence. The Druids would paint that in human blood on the people's front door. Someone would die between those nights because of the demonic forces that were summoned. Four or five hours later, the Druids would all return in this example, as I stated, back to Stonehenge. Once they got back to Stonehenge, they would take these people and put them in these cages. One particular cage is of um, great interest. They would take those wicker reeds. Remember how we had talked about those before, how the Easter egg landed in wicker? And it's a very, very durable material. What the Druids would do a week before Saul began, they would send the Celtic um, warriors out throughout the countryside where they would gather up thousands of these wicker reeds. Once they brought them back, they formed a giant wicker man. The wicker man looked something similar to this. It stood approximately 25 to 30 feet in height and was just intercrossing wicker reed to where it formed the effigy of a human man. This would usually be two to three levels in height and have cages running throughout it. The Druids, once they brought back all the, all the human sacrifice offerings from trick-or-treating, they would throw them into those cages and tie them. Now, if by some chance they ran out of space in the wicker man, they had these regular square cages made out of wicker that they had set aside just in case. Now, this is where the Druids now would have their version of fun. They would take approximately 12 prisoners, 12 people now, who were going to be used as human sacrifice offerings, and line them up in a single row in front of that cauldron. They would take an apple, throw it into the cauldron, and say, if you can take that in between your teeth on the first try, you will be set free immediately. Who would do that? Raise your hand. Who would try to grab that apple in between their teeth so that they could be set free? Who would do it? Raise your hand, please. There's only one problem, though. That cauldron has been boiling away for four to five hours now. The boiling temperature of liquid is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, who would do it? No volunteers? You? You know you'd be the only one then who would, chance, who would have a chance of living. You see, if you didn't try for it, you were going to end up as a human sacrifice offering anyways. 
This was your only way out. Every single person there did take the chance, except with dire consequences, let's face it. After they plunged their heads into that boiling liquid, their faces, their neck, and I don't even know how much of their um, chest and back, literally was just melting to where they would be permanently disfigured and unrecognizable. Many of them went blind because of the 212 degree liquid that was burning their eye sockets away. Many end up as partially or permanently deaf because of the damage that was done to their ear canal and the damage that was done to their speech and to their respiratory system because all that liquid was funneling down their throats while they were trying to grab that apple. And yes, this is where you've got that cutesy little game bobbing for apples. Now, if you did grab that apple on the first try in between your teeth, they held to their promise. They let you go some life afterwards. But if you didn't do it, they would throw you on the ground and behead you right there on the spot. Samhain is the highest night of human sacrifice on the Illuminati's calendar. And the reason it is, is because this is at this time of the year, what's known as a crossroad. It ends the old year and begins the new one. Now, all crossroads in the occult are sacred. Um, another example would be where the beach begins and uh, where the beach ends and the ocean begins. That's a crossroad. That's considered a sacred spot. All crossroads are sacred. Now, during this time of the year, it is believed that those souls that had, over, that had died from who knows how long ago because the um, veil that separated into third and fourth dimension are supposed to be at their thinnest, those departed souls can cross over and visit their loved ones for the night. But nothing guaranteed that these spirits would be um, benevolent. In order to keep these spirits in line, the Druids came up with these hideous masks and decorated their robes with all types of occult symbols to control these demonic spirits, if you would. And you know, this is where you get your um, costumes for trick-or-treating from. Let's face it, it comes straight with the mask and the outfit to this very day.